The Veil of Moses Removed, Does the Bible Teach Premillennialism? by Rev. D. Earl Kripe. Read by Eric J. Miller. Read more at godspointofview.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description. Chapter 6. The Temporal and Eternal Meanings of the Terms Israel, Judah, and the Promised Land. In the course of studying the kingdom of God, one of the questions that gets asked, and that deserves an answer, is whether the terms that literally identify the Old Covenant components have any figurative, metaphorical, allegorical, idiomatic, or prophetic properties. That is, do they symbolically represent anything real in the New Covenant? My answer is that, despite some rather emphatic notions to the contrary, they do. And I think to point this out by a rather brief examination of them from the scriptures. Israel. The term Israel means the prince of God. Actually, in its strictest literal sense, it means he will rule as God. Consistent with its temporary prophetic nature, national Israel lived up to this role in a certain limited sense. It was through them that God spoke to the rest of the world in those days, and it was through them that he accomplished his preliminary work, for which it was his plan to use them. More could be said about that, but it would not help us get to the point. The thing that is of significance here is that the Old Testament Israel was representative of Christ, and the children of Israel were representative of the spiritual children. In the term Israel, much is revealed and witnessed about the change in the covenants. First of all, we observe that Jacob's name was not changed to Israel until after he wrestled with God and received his blessing. As such, he became a type of Christ. He was the father of the patriarchs and ruler over God's people, just as Christ is over the people of God. In Hosea 11, we have a prophetic teaching which is instructive along this line. The prophet wrote, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Hosea 11.1 Our minds go immediately to God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 and the deliverance from the bondage of Egypt and the Red Sea. But this is not what the Holy Spirit had in mind for this prophecy, according to his own interpretation. In St. Matthew 2, the meaning is given for us. The story is of Joseph and Mary leaving Bethlehem and going into Egypt to escape the efforts of Herod to take the life of the infant Jesus. They stayed until Herod was dead, and then, when Herod's son Archelaus took the throne, they came back, but went to Galilee to avoid his jurisdiction. All of this was done according to verse 15, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Christ was the true Israel, the Prince of God. He was the one who would reign as God. Thus, the child Jesus was identified by the prophet as the true Israel. In addition to that, we have a testimony in Galatians 6, where the Apostle Paul refers to the spiritual children of promise, those who are Christ through faith in Jesus, as the Israel of God. So, we see that not only is Christ identified as the true Israel, but the church is identified as the true children of Israel. In 2 Peter 2, the apostle identifies the church as the true nation of God, the spiritual children of Israel. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed." But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7-10 through 10. Under the Old Covenant, the church was not the people of God, but under the New Covenant, that has changed. The natural children rejected the cornerstone, and they were in turn rejected. Surely, no one believes that a lying, immoral, adulterous, murdering gang of blasphemers was the Prince of God, more holy and honorable than those who are born again and indwelt by the Holy Ghost. 
Do they? Christ took the kingdom from them, see Matthew 21, 42 through 43, and gave it to the spiritual children. The church is now the chosen people and order of Melchizedek priests, the holy nation of God, and his peculiar treasure. This is fully consistent with all that we know concerning the contrasting values and importance of the Old and the New Covenant. The strange and inconsistent thing would be if some temporary symbol of the National Covenant, the strange and inconsistent thing would be if some temporary symbol of the National Covenant suddenly stepped out of character and superseded in importance the things in the New Covenant of Christ's blood that it was divinely appointed to prophetically represent. This, if it could successfully be proven, which it cannot, would not only create confusions in the prophetic witness of the term Israel and its New Testament interpretation, but would knock hard against the very fundamental and basic doctrine of the complete failure of the Old Covenant and the need for the New Covenant. See Jeremiah 31, 31. Judah the truth as it applies to Judah is not as graphic as that of Israel, but it is just as clear and important. Israel, or Jacob, had predicted that Judah would be the one whom his brothers would praise. The basis for the prophetic witness of Judah and his representation of the new covenant and the spiritual people was established in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. God had told Solomon in 1 Kings 11.11 11, that because of his disobedience and idolatry, God was going to take the kingdom of Israel away from the house of David. This he would not do during Solomon's lifetime, but during the reign of his son. When Rehoboam came to power, he took the bad advice of the young men among his counselors and dealt with the people in a very high-handed and cruel way. The result was that the people revolted from him except the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and formed the kingdom of Israel under the rule of Jeroboam. Shortly thereafter, Rehoboam assembled 180,000 chosen men out of Judah and Benjamin and was going to fight against Israel and bring that kingdom back under the rule of Rehoboam to reunite the kingdom. But God sent word by Shemaiah and told them not to do what they had planned. He told them that this division was by his design and that he did not want the two kingdoms rejoined. See 1 Kings 12, 22-24. Several things were established as prophetic testimonies in this situation. Number one, the national people, as represented by the kingdom of Israel, were rejected by God. Number two, the natural kingship of David and his seed had failed to live up to God's requirements and were being rejected as a means of bringing in God's righteous kingdom. Number three, the hope rested with Christ and the new covenant as represented by the kingdom of Judah. Number four, the irreconcilable division between Israel and Judah was a further testimony of the two covenants and their totally different prospects. The important thing from the beginning was Christ and the redemption of fallen man through him. This is just another of the many instances where we have observed God's refusal to allow this testimony to be eliminated. That was why he forbade the reuniting of the two kingdoms. Judah, when in contrast with Israel and representing the new covenant, which is often the case from this time forward, must be interpreted as Christ and the church. We have seen how this is indeed the case, as in Jeremiah 31, where the establishing of the new covenant is prophesied. And unless that interpretation of Jeremiah 31 would seem to be twisted to something else, we have an interpretation put on it for us in Hebrews chapter 8. In that instance, the context, as well as the language, leaves no room to see anything but the covenant of Jesus Christ's blood. In Hebrews 8, the author begins by telling us that all of those prophetic things have become a reality for us through Christ and his death and resurrection. He verifies the point by saying that the Lord has foretold this through the prophets when he said, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 8 and 10. The fact that Jesus Christ has brought us righteousness by faith, the Holy Spirit, and the perfect provision for the Christian walk, which is the context of this Hebrews passage, is given as the interpretation and explanation of that passage in Jeremiah. In this instance, not only can Israel and Judah be referring to Christ and the spiritual seed, 
but they can only be a reference to this because they are being used here as realities in the new covenant, not as prophetic symbols of the old. Galatians chapter 4 establishes that the natural seed did not share in the inheritance of the covenant of promise as a national entity, but only as individuals through faith and grace, as others did. In this condition, they become an inseparable mix with the spiritual seed, and a part of the Israel of God and the sons of Israel who praise their father. That is what the name Judah means. That is what the natural Judah was, and that is why he prophetically represented the sons of Christ. The Promised Land Much of what we could say about the Promised Land being temporal and symbolic under the Old Covenant and an eternal fulfillment under the New has already been said in the repeated defining of the two covenants and their separate prospects. All that remains in this regard is to show clearly that the geographical land was a part of the Old Covenant. It faded from particular biblical significance with the passing of the Old Covenant. But the promised land of the New Covenant was to be, and is, of spiritual and eternal character. Whatever the promised land of the New Covenant is, it is the fulfillment of the Old Testament rest. It is important to note that this difference was established by God himself when he first spoke to Abraham about it. In Genesis chapter 15, God defined the land to Abraham as the land between the Nile and the Euphrates and the land that was inhabited by those various tribes that had possession of it. Later he said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Joshua chapter 1 Verses 2 through 9. So we see that God defined this land as to what it was, when the possession of it would begin, and what conditions must be met and maintained for the conquest to be successful. The power of God and the occupation of the land would only be realized if the law were kept. In Genesis chapter 17, when God made the covenant of promise with Abraham and confirmed it in Christ, he spoke differently about the land of promise. He said, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land therein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Genesis 17, 8. Again, we feel constrained to observe that if we had nothing brighter to interpret with than the light that Abraham had, or the prophets after him, the language here would not be that different or important. But when we look at it from the point of view of the New Testament revelation, the difference is most significant as the meaning is interpreted for us. In Hebrews chapter 3, God uses the illustration of the children in the wilderness, their hardness of heart, and their refusal to obey him and possess the land as a warning against faithlessness in our Christian lives that will result in disobedience and forfeiture of the blessing. He uses the fact that the first generation came out of Egypt, but then died in the wilderness and never entered into the rest, in order to warn of the possibility of a person being a Christian, but through faithlessness, unbelief, lust, 
living a barren and fruitless life, never entering into the rest of Christ, which is the abundant life. Then he goes on to say that being reborn spiritually and being a child of God is not all that he wants or expects of us in this life. There is still a sabbatism, a seventh, a rest, for the people of God to enter into. He exhorts us that if we do not strive to enter into it, we may fall after the same example of unbelief of the children of Israel in the wilderness. This rich, abundant life, this land of walking in the Spirit and working the works of God, is the land promised to Abraham and his seed for an everlasting inheritance. Some will say that there is a flaw in viewing the Christian walk as being one and the same with the land of promise, because we will die someday, so this present situation is not eternal after all. Well, that calls for a brief definition of tripartite man, what he is and how the redemptive program of God relates to him. Man is body, soul, and spirit. Each of these component parts of man were affected by the fall, and each are affected, or at least provided for, by the redemption. Man dies because of sin. He is resurrected because of righteousness. When Adam and Eve sinned, the race died an immediate spiritual death. The spirit in man became dead. He lost his personal relationship to God. It is in this state of spiritual death that man is born. We are conceived in sin, and we are strangers from God from the womb. Because of sin, man's soul, his life on this earth, is lost day by day. As man goes along living in sin, he suffers the death of his soul. He loses his life. Eventually, because of sin, man's body will die. The redemption that Christ has provided for us comprehends the resurrection and the salvation of man's spirit, soul, and body. When a person calls upon Jesus Christ as his Savior, he is reborn, resurrected, and saved in his spirit. If he that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, St. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, speaking of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. He went on to say that such is the case no matter how that man is behaving, even if he is living carnally and his life in this mortal body is dead because of sin. Once a man has come to Jesus Christ and is alive in spirit, he is then in a position to walk in the spirit and to save his life by losing it for Christ's sake. This is the part of salvation, redemption, and the resurrection that has to do with our daily lives. This, in other words, is the state of saving or the losing of the soul. If you can live carnally after the flesh, you shall die, said St. Paul. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Romans 8, 13. St. James said that he who converted a brother from the error of his ways saved a soul from death. The writer of Hebrews, speaking of Christian obedience, said... But we are not of those who turn back unto destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10, 39. St. Peter, in talking about the trial of our faith and the reward of faithfulness, said, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1, 9. Again, he talked of obedience as being the purifying of our souls. 1 Peter 1.22, and he warned that we should abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against our souls. 1 Peter 2.11. He says that those who are suffering for righteousness' sake should commit the keeping of their souls to Christ in well-doing. 1 Peter 4.19. In Acts 14.22, we are told that the apostles went about confirming the souls of the disciples, and warned them of the danger of the legalists who are out to subvert the souls of God's children. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, St. Paul prayed that God would sanctify them wholly, body, soul, and spirit. Jesus raised the question as to what eventual profit there would be in it if a man gained the whole world but lost his own soul. He further told them that in their patience, they would possess their own souls. Luke 21, 19. St. Paul spoke about the same thing when he said in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. 
not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. St. Paul wasn't expressing doubts as to whether or not he was a Christian, nor was he questioning if he was going to be in the resurrection on the last day. He was talking about today in his life. Again, he spoke of the same thing in Romans chapter 6. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become the servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verses 20-23 through 23. And to the Galatians, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 9 And to Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hast professed, a good profession before many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6.12 And again to Timothy, That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 18 and 19 And again, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. All of these things combine to show us that eternal life is a present reality and issue, that the resurrection has application to our daily lives. The saving or losing of our souls or our lives is directly dependent upon how we live and what kind of appropriation we make of the gift that God has given to us. This whole area is identified by the writer of Hebrews as the promised land and is summarized in the thought expressed by these words. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 28 and 29. All Old Testament promises by God to the nation with respect to the geographical land were fulfilled. The Holy Spirit affirmed that to be the case through the prophet in Joshua. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about, according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them, the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 through 45. Perhaps you are like some of my dispensational friends who tell me that they do not care what the Bible says. It never happened. It is sad indeed that otherwise godly men are so married to their religious traditions that they are willing to deny the Bible and call God an out-and-out -out liar. I would hope that you are not one of those, but if you are, I cannot help you, nor do I want to. If the Bible is not your source of truth, then we have no common denominator. If you believe the Bible to say that this is not the case, then again I invite you to show me. I say you cannot do it. Why not prove me wrong? 
The question as to whether or not this land is eternal is just as easily answered as the question, does the Christian have, as a present possession, eternal life? Can he, in the present, and speaking of the Christian walk, lay hold upon eternal life? The fact that someday this earth is going to be destroyed, someday this body is going to die and we are going to have immortal bodies, and that someday this creation is going to be destroyed and we are going to have a new heaven and earth, does not detract from, diminish, or cancel out that which at the present is eternal. It only affects that which is temporal, carnal, and corruptible. But if any man's work shall abide, they that sow to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting, is the promise and the fact. The possessions and the fruits of the spiritual land of promise are indeed eternal, just as is every other part of the covenant of promise. End of chapter 6 of The Veil of Moses Removed by Rev. D. Earl Kripe Read by Eric J. Miller Read more at godspointofview.com a copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.